Now, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles and read from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, or you can just follow along on the screen. All the scriptures will be up there for you. Ephesians chapter 6, starting verse number 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Verse 14. Stand firm, then, with a the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Now today we're going to be talking about the last... A piece of personal armor that the Apostle Paul tells us we need to put on or take up as Christians, Christian soldiers, Christian warriors, because all Christians are soldiers. Just not all very good soldiers. All Christians are warriors. It's just that some of us aren't very good at it yet. But I believe that you can get better. I believe that you can be a better soldier. And I believe that God has given me a very simple sermon today that will help you to become a better warrior. You have probably come today to hear the simplest sermon that I think that I have ever preached. I really only have one main point. And when you hear it, you will say, well, that's just common sense. And see, I don't believe in common sense. <laughs> No, nothing common about sense, amen? So I, but, but when I read this, when, I, when it came to me, look, I usually prepare my sermons like on Monday. I didn't get this till Friday. And then it was like, we call it in the Army VFO, a blind, blinding flash of the obvious. It's like, wow, that is so easy. That's so, you are for the, you're going to listen to the simplest sermon I've ever preached. I hope that it helps you to become a better warrior because, Christian, you are at war, whether you like it or not. That makes you a warrior, and by definition, that makes you uncomfortable. There's nothing comfortable about warfare. And so you're going to experience discomfort, and we don't like that. We like comforts, ease, and convenience. We love so many things that we can live without. We just don't want to. A lot of things. I mean, just for instance, electricity which we're having a difficult time with in this sanctuary. Boy, we love electricity. But you know that for 99.99, I did the math, for 99.99% of human history, they didn't have electricity. Now, we're thankful for it. But the truth is, we can live without it. We don't want to, but if all of a sudden we had to live without electricity, we wouldn't all just die. We just don't want to. We love our comforts. But war is uncomfortable, and what I'm saying today is fight anyway. Amen. I mentioned last week when we say something about forsaking worldly pleasures in this world. Forsaking, and sometimes we do. We do forsake worldly pleasures sometimes, but not very often. I mean, when's the last time that you fasted? We don't like those discomforts. We don't like uncomfortable things. We want to be comfortable. But I was talking with somebody the other day who told me that he is always packing, always carrying a gun. He's got a gun with him everywhere that he goes. And I have other friends like that. I have many friends like that. It doesn't bother me at all. But it bothers some people. It makes some people very uncomfortable to know that somebody around them is carrying a gun. Because we all know that there are some people who shouldn't be carrying those guns. <laughs> There are some people that are probably doing more harm than good. They're just asking for trouble. And that makes people uncomfortable. Be always being armed makes some people uncomfortable, but it also make, may, may make us and them more safe. I know this. Satan, spiritually now, Satan wants you to be unarmed. Yes. He wants you to be unarmored. Don't fight. Why do you have to fight all the time? Don't fight. Can't we all 
all just get along? I mean, Christians and Muslims and Hindus and atheists, and you just do your thing and let them do their thing, and can't we all just get along? And the answer, of course, is no. No, because Jesus said, go after those that are lost. Tell them that they're going to hell. We're just going to make them mad, and it's going to make the devil mad, and it's warfare. But if you love people, you're just going to sit back and let them go to hell? No, we can't all just get along. And today we're talking about fighting. And fighting is what soldiers are for. Hear me, folks. We don't have wars because we have armies. There are people saying, we just lay down our arms, everybody will leave you alone. And that's not true. I'm a history major. I know this stuff. We don't have wars because we have armies. We have armies because we have wars. And fighting is what soldiers exist for. And fighting is what weapons are for. And today we're talking about the most powerful and yet often the most neglected weapon in the universe. It's the Bible. And the title of this morning's message is The Word. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. So thankful for your word. It's powerful. It's sharp. And it's going to accomplish your purpose today. Touch each one of us, Lord God, that we'll receive from you what you have for us to receive and respond to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nothing can defeat God's word, and it is a weapon made for aggression. And Paul calls this sixth and last piece of our personal armament the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I remember when I was a kid, the pastors used to do this all the time. In fact, I had youth pastors that would do this. They'd get up to preach, and they'd read their text. But before they read it, they'd say, all right, everybody, hold up your sword. Everybody remember that? Everybody hold up your sword. And everybody knew, you know, grab our Bibles and, you know, the ones that had Bibles. And we would hold up these swords. And now, you know, you've got to hold up that phone. <laughs> I meant to have my phone up here, but I forgot. whole lot less impressive. But listen, there's nothing special about this having leather binding and paper and print. If you've got a phone and it's got the Word of God on it, that's just as good. As long as you keep it with you and as long as you know how to use it. And almost every message that deals with the Bible as the sword of the Spirit seems to concentrate on your personal responsibility to read and know the scriptures. And I preach that way myself all the time. You have to read the Bible every day, and you've got to be able to memorize scriptures in order to have it in your heart. You have to read and remember God's word. Amen. Psalm 119 and verse number 11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart so I might not sin against you. So you need to memorize God's word. Now you don't have to memorize all of it. There are very few people who have ever done that. I'm not saying you have to memorize the whole Bible. But if you read the Bible enough, you read the Bible every single day, and it's alive. Scriptures will become alive to you, and you'll remember them. Maybe not word for word, but you'll remember what you read, and you'll be able to use them because you have to know it to be able to use it. Yeah. But I think that God wants me to make it very easy on you today. And so I'm just going to give you some ideas that will help you to fight the devil. These ideas with the Word of God to help you to fight the devil. They can be used on offense when you see an opportunity to attack. They can also be used on defense if you're already under attack. But I'm going to make this as easy and as convenient for you as possible because that's the way I like to teach. Some teachers seem to think if I make it too easy for my students, they won't apply themselves and they won't learn very well. If I make it too easy, they won't work hard enough and they won't learn. To me, those are lazy teachers. I put a lot of effort into this to make it as simple for you as possible to learn. If I know something and I want you to learn it, I'll try 10 different ways to make it as easy as possible for you to remember that thing. The objective in teaching is to help students learn. Yes. Then you test them so that you know that they've learned, but also so that they can see that they have learned and that they can learn. And it encourages them to get a good education. It builds confidence and it helps them to grow. So I have one objective in teaching. The, the overriding objective of all my preaching and teaching is, is this. Make things clear. Make the gospel of Jesus Christ clear, which a lot of Christians don't seem to be able to do. How do you tell people about Jesus? How do, you, how do you communicate? They need a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And too many Christians just don't know how to communicate that gospel. So I teach things to make it very clear. So that's why I use outlines. And that's why I use PowerPoint slides. I work hard to teach clearly. 
Some people are visual learners, and they like stuff like this PowerPoint. Other people are distracted. I've heard people to complain to me. It's just too distracting, all these things flying up on the, on the screen. And other people are visual learners. They like this. Some people are more like me. They're more like kinesthetic. Got to touch it. Got to feel it. And that's why in the outlines I put blanks so you can actually fill in the blank because that's what I like. I preach the way I would like to be preached to. And that's what I like. I like to fill in blanks. And it, and it helps me to learn, write stuff down, touch it. And then some people are more auditory. They just have to hear it. And they process it well by just hearing it. They don't need the notes. They don't need the PowerPoint. But you can hear too, right? Mm -hmm. And so whatever it takes to help you to learn, I just want you to learn. Yeah. I want you to learn today how to use your Bible, the sword of the Spirit, so that you can see that you can win in spiritual warfare. You can defeat the devil mm -hmm. by using the Word of God. And I'm going to show you how, and hopefully it will build your confidence and help you grow, even though this is so almost embarrassingly simple. This is so simple. How do you use the Word of God to defeat the devil? Because we're talking about the Bible as an, uh, the sword of the Spirit as a way to win spiritual warfare, to defeat the devil. So how do you use the Word of God to defeat the devil? And here it is. You ready for this? You use it out loud. Yes. You got to say it. Yes. You got to speak it. You know why? It's very simple. The devil can't read your mind. Now, aren't you glad about that? He doesn't know what you're thinking. So you might be thinking the Bible all the time. But how can you use that against the devil who can't read your mind? You've got to say it. You've got to confess it. Not saying the word of God out loud is like having your sword, but it's in the sheath all the time. It's like having your weapon, your gun, but it's holstered. I mean, he's shooting at you and you're not shooting back. Pull that thing out. Use your weapon against him. He cannot always know what's on your mind. He can't read your mind. Amen. Now, he can guess, and he's pretty smart. He, he's, a, he's a student of human nature. He's been around for a long time. And there are probably demons around you who are assigned to you or your area, and they probably know you pretty well, so they can guess what's on your mind, but it's just a guess. And they can probably influence your thinking, but he doesn't really know what you're thinking. He doesn't read your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking unless you tell him. Tell him. Make him hear it. Make him hear God's word coming out of your mouth. Amen. That's exactly how Jesus Christ defeated the devil. Amen. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. Wonderful, wonderful saint. Then immediately after his baptism, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, immediately after his baptism, the Bible says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Luke tells us he was tempted the whole time. Matthew concentrates on the end of that 40-day fast when Jesus is very tired. He's as tired as a human being can be. He's dehydrated. He's hungry. He's weak. It's the lowest point, the weakest point of his life. And that's when the devil comes against him and attacks him so severely. And how did Jesus defeat him? Mm -hmm. By quoting the scriptures. Amen. It is written, yeah. man shall not live by bread alone. Mm -hmm. It is written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then he said, now get away from me, Satan. Mm -hmm. He used the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. Now look at this next word. Rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Anybody want to rebuke the devil? Amen. How do you think you should do it? The word Amen. of God. Speak the word of God against him and speak it out loud. Yes. And so I just want to give you four ways, some of which you're probably already doing. A couple of these you're probably already doing, but all four of them everybody can do and probably should do. And the first one is pray out loud. Pray God's word. I know you can't always pray out loud. I mean, if you're, you should be praying all the time. But if you're in Walmart and you're praying out loud, that may not quite be the right place to do it. People are probably going to think you're crazy. I don't know. Whatever God tells you to do. But I'm not saying. But there are times when you can pray out loud. Here's how I pray. I pray the Lord's Prayer pattern. The Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. It's a pattern. Jesus didn't say this is what you should pray. Jesus said this is how you should pray. 
And he starts off with praise. And he talks about purpose. And he talks about petition, asking for things. And then pardon. I pray that. So I'm praying the scriptures throughout my entire prayer time. You ought to have a prayer time set aside where you're praying, hopefully alone, and you can pray out loud sometimes. Now, I always say this. In your prayer time, which I hope you do every day, you ought to set aside at least five or ten minutes every single day consistently that you spend with God. And in that time, read the Bible first. And then pray. Where does faith come from? Mm -hmm. Hearing the scriptures, hearing the word. Pray first, builds up your faith. Uh, read first, builds up your faith. And then pray. And so when you're praying, meditating on God's word just means whatever you read, bring it back up. Mm -hmm. Meditate on it. So in your prayer time, include the word of God. Either try to remember a scripture or just keep your Bible open or your phone on, wherever you read from. And keep it in front of you and pray out loud whenever you can. A second way that you can do this is by singing. Sing God's Word. And everybody here sings. We're just not all real good singers, are we? <laughs> Some of us can't really be all that much better, to be honest with you, but we all sing. Come on now, you're driving your car, hoping you got the radio on, on some Christian station. Not, not always singing Christian music, but sometimes, often we're singing Christian music, aren't we? And hopefully it's scriptural, and, and our songs that we sing are so filled with God's Word, so scriptural. Sing out loud. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, and verse number 19 says, Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. So here's what I want you to know about your singing. This is so important. Get this now. God loves it. God loves your singing. Maybe nobody else does. But God, look, I don't like my singing. I have what I call a choir voice. If I'm standing next to somebody who can sing, I can kind of follow along. But if you heard me sing, you'd be like, mm, no. And I sing all the time. This is my prayer room. I walk around and around. I come here every day because this is where I pray. And I walk around and around. And, 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 and praise is more than half of my prayer life is praise. And a lot of that is singing. The other day, I was in here praying. And I was trying to praise God. And I was so distracted. But it wasn't about bad things. It was about good things, good news. I was just overwhelmed with good news such that I wasn't able to concentrate. I couldn't even praise. And God said, Jeff, not out loud, but he said, Jeff, just sing. You got words. Just sing. And I spent a long time just singing. Here's what I believe happens. When I sing praises to God, I know there's at least one angel here. And when I'm singing praises to God, that angel, and all angels can sing, that angel sings with me. And I believe he calls some buddies over. And I believe there's an angelic chorus going up, making me sound really good. <laughs> God loves my singing. And the devil hates it. Can't stand it. Can't endure it. Because it's filled with God's praise. It's filled with God's word. Praise the Lord. Sing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. He hates your singing, so hit him hard. And hit him often. Praise God through singing and sing right out loud. Amen. The third way that you can, you can use God's word out loud is to discuss God's word. Talk to other people about it. Colossians chapter 8, uh, chapter 3, verse number 16. I think this was the last scripture my dad preached when he preached for us here. My dad preached for me quite often here. And I think the last one he, he preached and used... This scripture, Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now, admonish can mean warning and correction, but when it's Christian to Christian, here's what it always means. It always means help. Help each other out. And one of the ways you can help each other is when you read something in the Bible that touches your heart, share it with somebody. And everybody can do this. Tell somebody what you read in your daily Bible study. Now, be careful that it's somebody who cares. Because if you keep going to the same people over and over and they're getting tired of hearing it and they don't want to hear it, you're going to wear that person out. And when you go to talk to somebody about the Scriptures, don't brag and don't preach. Don't preach it, people. I'm so guilty of this. I was just preaching to my board. We had a board meeting before church. I said, I'm sorry, I'm preaching to you. I was preaching to Michelle yesterday at the house, and she says, you're preaching, Jeff. <laughs> I'm a preacher. <laughs> we do what we do. I'm sorry. I, but don't, don't preach at people. Here's what you do. You read something that touches you. 
God's word comes alive when you read it and just tell somebody else. It might encourage that person. Share with somebody, a spouse, a family member, a friend, maybe even a coworker if it's the right setting. I mean, if you can't work and talk, just work. <laughs> but if you can, just find, find an opportunity to tell somebody. How about social media? You want to put something on Facebook? Put the word of God on there. Amen. The devil can't read your mind, but he can read your Facebook. Amen. And it'll hurt him. Put it on there. Tell people. Now, just be cautious about this. You don't necessarily have to try to interpret it. Because I've seen some really bad interpretation of scriptures on Facebook. But I have friends that just post the scripture. And there's always somebody that says, I needed that today. That really encouraged me today. Discuss God's word. Say it out loud and then talk to other people about God's word. And then one more way. For those who are called, teach God's word. Now, I say to those who are called because we all have a calling to be teachers if we're parents. If you're a parent, you're your children's number one teacher, even when they're grown. If you're a grandparent, teach your grandkids. But unless you are called to teach other people outside of your family, you may not want to get involved in that. But God says, tell people, if you want to make the devil mad, teach God's word. Mm -hmm. And one of Satan's greatest goals is to silence teachers. Anybody who tells somebody else about Jesus is going to be under a satanic attack, but especially those who do it systematically, who do it continually, especially teachers of God's Word. Teaching God's Word is one of the most effective ways to use the sword of the Spirit, but it is also one of the most dangerous ways. Teaching is effective, and it's also dangerous. If you think that the devil is hard on you now, be a teacher. It's like painting a target on your back. But that's not the only thing. It's not just that you have a target on you if you're being a teacher. That's not the only thing that makes, te that makes teaching a tough ministry. It also, teaching also involves much greater responsibility. And so the Bible says in James chapter 3 and verse number 1, not many of you, brothers, should presume to be teachers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. There are a lot of bad things that can happen to you when you start teaching God's word. Satan can use it against you. One of the things that can enter in is pride. You can become proud because I'm the teacher and you're just students. I'm above you. Look at me. Look at my position. Look at my education. Pride can enter in. Another thing that can happen, especially after you've been teaching for a long time, is you can become a little bit lazy. And maybe not take that teaching as seriously. It's so serious. When you are in front of people communicating God's word, it is so serious. Don't ever take it lightly. But sometimes you think, well, I don't really need to prepare that much for this. I got this. Whenever you start saying, I got this, you don't got this. And so maybe you don't prepare as well. And error can creep in. And you can start teaching things incorrectly. See, Satan hates good teachers. Satan loves bad teachers. Mm -hmm. Satan inspires false teachers. Mm -hmm. And so before you start teaching, make your calling sure. Yes. Make sure it's what you're called to do. Mm -hmm. But if you feel called to teach, regardless of the difficulties, regardless of the dangers, if you feel called to teach, I'm talking about this next week, be bold and teach anyway. We need more Bible teachers. We need more Bible teaching. It doesn't always have to happen in formal environments, but we need to teach God's Word. Nothing hurts Satan more than teachers who not only sharpen their swords, but help other people sharpen their own swords. Amen. There is no more effective weapon than the Word of God. And yet, most people who call themselves Christians hardly ever read the Bible. Some people don't read it because they say, I just don't understand it. I've heard that so many times. I just don't understand it. Well, I'll say this first of all. If you're reading the King James Version, I don't understand it either. I was raised with it. And I, I, it's not the only anointed version. Of, it's only an English translation. It wasn't originally written in 16th century English. Get you an updated translation and then find something that you can't understand. But what you need most of all is a teacher yes. 
Philip and that Ethiopian eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? How can I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? And so here's the main reason I think that many Christians don't read the Bible. You're doing okay. What can that add to my life? I'm a good person. I go to church. I know I'm safe. I'm kind. I pay tithes. And I hadn't read the Bible in years. I've never read the Bible every day. And I'm doing fine. And I just say, you really sure about that? I would say, what does God say about that? Which means, what does the Bible say about that? And here's what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved to God. And then it goes on to say, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, which you don't know if you don't study. Amen. Psalm 119, verse number 11, I've already said to you, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I'm telling you, you don't know what God wants you to do tomorrow if you hadn't asked. Amen. You think, I know what I'm going to do. On it's Monday, I'm going to go to work in the morning. I know what time I'm supposed to be there. I know what to do when I get there. I know what to do, so I don't need God. You don't know what to do, so yes, you need God. His word is your lamp. His word is your light. You need the scriptures because you don't know the attack that you're going to come under tomorrow, but God does. Amen. Anybody want to defeat Satan tomorrow? Amen. You need the word of God tomorrow. Amen. And if you don't do what God says, you are on your own. And you can't defeat the devil on your own. And so James chapter 4, verse number 7 says this. Submit yourselves then to God, which means obey God. Submit yourselves then to God. Then you can resist the devil and he'll run away from you. It's going to take effort to fight against the devil. Resistance is going to take effort. But you can do it. You can make the devil run. Here's how. And it's the only way. Get into the Word of God. Submit yourselves to God, and you can make the devil run. Read the Bible every day. Talk about it often. This is what you use to rebuke the devil. This is what you use to praise God. This is what you use to help other people. And so I'm saying today, this is my weapon. Will you say it with me? This is my weapon. Say it one more time. This is my weapon. And I'm going to get really good at using it to fight the devil. Amen. How about you? Amen. Father, we're so thankful for your word, and it is a powerful weapon. I thank you, Lord God, for how it makes us sharper, how it, how it can make us more like Jesus, and how it can help us to accomplish the purpose that you've given us in life. God, how desperately we need you, and I pray that you'll give us a hunger for your word. There are people who are listening to me right now who haven't read the Bible in a long time. There are people who are watching on this video who maybe have never read the Bible, especially every day. But I pray that you'll inspire us, that you'll get a hold of our hearts, that you'll change us. Help us to know, Lord God, who we are in you. Help us, Lord God, to know, I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. Give us a hunger and a thirst for your word and make us powerful warriors to accomplish your purpose. In Jesus' matchless name I pray.